A few lectures back, we talked about the origins of the demand curve from our supply and demand graphs. But we didn't say much about supply curves. That's because at that point, we didn't have all the necessary tools to build supply curves. But now we do. OK, so quick review. What's a supply curve? It's the curve that shows how much of a good the firm's willing to supply at each price of the good. And we just worked out in this last lecture that to maximize short-run profit, firms will want to produce until marginal benefit, otherwise known as the price, equals marginal cost. Here's the table showing the marginal cost of producing another golden snitch at each level of production from earlier. When the price of snitches was $30, the firm chose to produce eight snitches. This is the point at which price equals marginal cost. Let's plot this point in a graph where the x-axis is quantity and the y-axis is price. If the price were different, the firm would make a different choice. Say the price of a snitch was $10. For the marginal cost to be equal to the price and profit to be maximized, the firm would need to produce six snitches. And if the price was $20, the firm would want to produce seven snitches to get marginal cost equal to price, maximizing profit. We can do the same thing for prices of $40 and $50. And we can connect the dots to include intermediate prices like $13 and $47.50. Each of these points on the curve captures the answer the firm gets the following question, asked over and over again for different prices. How many snitches should it produce to maximize profits at that price? Since the answer to this question in the short run is the firm should produce until the marginal cost is equal to the price, the points we've plotted here sketch out the marginal cost curve. For a given quantity, the corresponding price given by this curve is the marginal cost at that level of production. But you usually hear this curve referred to by its more common name, the supply curve. The supply curve traces out the quantities a firm would choose at any price to maximize profit. But what if the maximum profit is negative? What if the whole production is a money loser? Remember that in the short run, the firm doesn't just have marginal cost. It also has fixed costs, the cost of capital like factories and equipment. These costs are paid no matter how much the firm produces. And because it can't do a thing about these fixed costs in the short run, the firm ignores them when it makes that production decision. It just compares the marginal cost to the price. So even if the firm sells a bunch of units until marginal cost equals price, it may still have negative profits. Imagine if the fixed cost for the snitch factory was back to $200 instead of $100, and all else is the same. If the price of a snitch is $30, the firm still maximizes profits by producing eight snitches but it is losing $40 at this production level. This doesn't sound like a very good deal for the snitch maker. So this raises the question, if the best a firm can do is get negative profits, should the firm just pack it in and shut down production? Not necessarily. Let's think about this. If the snitch maker called it quits and stopped all production, it's still on the hook for the $200 in fixed costs. That's equivalent to having profits of negative 200. This is even worse then the profit maximizing choice to produce eight snitches for a profit of negative 40. It might not sound like a very good deal, but I think we can all agree that losing $40 is a whole lot better than losing $200. This doesn't mean the firm will lose money forever. Once it gets to the long run, it can adjust its capital costs and have a chance of making positive profits. The key insight here is that sunk costs, costs that have already been incurred and cannot be recovered, should not impact a firm's decision about future actions. Sunk costs are sunk. So when should a firm decide to shut down production in the short run? To answer this, we must ignore the sunk fixed costs and focus only on the variable costs. If revenue is greater than variable costs, the firm should stay open. If not, the firm should shut down. Revenue is just price multiplied by the number of units produced. And variable costs is just average variable costs multiplied by the same number of units produced. So if the price of the good in the market ever falls below the average variable cost for the firm, the firm will cease production in the short run. This price threshold is known as the shutdown price. If the market price drops below the shutdown price, the firm will cease production and supply for the firm drops to zero. So all of this helps us understand where supply curves for individual firms come from. But what about the market supply curve? Just like we saw with demand curves, the market supply is simply the horizontal sum of the supply of all firms in the market at each price. Imagine we have two firms in the market with the same individual supply curve shown here. 
then you get a market supply curve that is double the quantity at any given price compared to the individual supply curve. At a price of $30, one firm supplies eight units to the market. But at this price, two firms would combine to supply 16. Notice that when more identical firms produce the good, the supply curve becomes flatter. That is, the supply of the good becomes more elastic as there are more firms in the market. The price elasticity of supply is greater. Supply is more responsive to changes in price when there are more firms. Why is this? Because a given increase in price stimulates a larger increase in supply when there are lots of firms than when it's just one firm.